Andrew did a great job at keeping everyone awake, so we're, we're just gonna roll with that. Um, so as Bernie said, I'm Cindy Brock with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and I am presiding over this panel. And I wanna thank them even before they've said a word, um, because they've been a very agile group. So I first wanna tell you a little bit about how this panel is gonna roll, where I will be asking them questions and they will be responding. And true, they have heard the questions in advance. This isn't a sort of, you know, a spot quiz, but um, these are not questions that we've developed knowing who the panelists are and feeding them something so that they can say what they say whenever they speak, which is very often the nature of, of panels where, you know, you, you bring in an expert and you kind of, you know, give them the slow pitch and then they hit it out of the park. These guys are going to hit it out of the park with a set of questions that are basically um, have been developed in response to the um, the responses that registrants for this workshop put in answers to the questions that they were asked. So the uh, illustrious roundtable staff, uh, at, when they when they designed the registration, they asked, "Well, what would you want to hear from a panel?" on evaluation of community health literacy interventions. And so um, Melissa French and I worked with the, the many questions that came in in response to develop the questions that you're gonna hear now. So these guys are, are earning the money that we're not paying them. Um, so uh, with that, um, and oh, the other way in which they have uh, shown their agility is that we were going to be a panel of four and Dr. Connie Arnold was not able to be with us at the last minute and they are again all pinch hitting and covering that terrain as well. So thank you all very much for being here. And now I'm going to try and mispronounce all of your names. Now, um, uh, and this being a, a health literacy uh, workshop, I will acknowledge that reading these introductions are not my forte, so excuse me if I stumble. So uh, to my immediate right is Oscar Espinoza, and he is a senior associate of community science at, sorry, at Community Science, which is a research evaluation development firm in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, Mr. Espinoza is an experienced health services researcher who specializes in the evaluation of programs that deliver services to vulnerable populations. And right next to him is Anil Thota, and he, uh, he is the lead for the systematic review science team at the Community Guide Branch within the Division of Public Health Information Dissemination at the CDC. That's the Centers for Disease Prevention and, no, uh, and Control. Sorry, see, I told you. But I didn't want to use acronyms because that's one of our rules here. Um, and the Community Guide Branch supports the Community Prevention Services Task Force, an independent panel of public health prevention experts, which issues findings based on systematic reviews of effectiveness and economic evidence of public interventions and policies for decision makers, policy makers, and implementers. And finally, we have Dr. Sherry Flint Wallington. She is Assistant Professor of Oncology and serves as the Program Director for the Health Disparities Initiative at Georgetown University's Lombardi Cancer Center. Her research interests focus on using community-based and community-based participatory research approaches to explore the role of health communication in reducing and eliminating health disparities among minority and underserved populations. So thank you all for being here. So we're gonna start with um, first question, um, thinking a little bit about trying to focus on the community-based health literacy piece of the evaluation that we're talking about. And so, you know, historically, um, the in clinical research, randomized control trials have been held up as, a, you know, a gold standard. And clearly, that is not and should not be the gold standard in evaluating community health literacy in, in interventions. So can you tell me what is the gold standard um, for community health literacy interventions and give me an example of such an evaluation? So, Anil, you wanna kick us off? Um, thank you. Um, 
it's great to be here. Uh, so I'm going to, so my answers are going to be from the perspective of somebody who does systematic reviews. So they're a little removed from the actual community, although all our efforts are to represent what is happening in the community with these interventions the best possible way so that the decisions that are made by the task force that then go out to public health practice and research uh, reflect that evidence. Uh, so the gold standard is always an interesting question uh, with the randomized control trials. Um, as you all probably know, RCTs are not practical. They're not, in many cases, ethical. When you go into the community, when you think about public health, uh, when you think about public health, you have policies. If you think about seat belt legislation requirement requiring seat belts, you cannot do a you do not want to do a randomized control trial to see if that works or not. So. So the community guide itself for the last, which is for the last 20 years with the Community Preventive Services Task Force, um, is, has developed methods over the years to think about how is it that you, we can make the best use of what we have where we are so that the context comes into uh, clarity uh, when making these decisions, so not sticking at RCT. So the, the whole concept of the gold standard itself is, is, is a little bit on the back burner. So you think about uh, the methods, you think about the transparency, you think about making everything very clear as to how it is that you did the synthesis. So it's not putting RCTs aside. RCTs are still an amazing study design. I mean, just conceptually, you cannot get better than an RCT, right? I mean, if something is it's randomized, uh, that's great, but uh, it is not practical for us. So for example, when you look at the quality of a study, uh, within a community guide review, we look at two aspects. So one aspect is the study design itself. And within that, we have ca categories like the greatest suitability of study design, the uh, moderate suitability, and the least suitability. So again, we're talking about suitability of study design to make that decision. We're not judging the study per se. We're judging it for the sake of making that decision. And even a study uh, in the community guide, which is not randomized, but say has a contemporaneous control group, which has a control group that or a comparable community that uh, also went through that same period of time, the, the task force developed methods where that can also go into the greatest suitability with an RCT. So that allows, uh, quote unquote, allows for other studies to also enter the body of evidence. And then you have the studies where you may only have something that's cross-sectional. Uh, rather than say there's no evidence, we say this is the evidence we have, this is what is available, and maybe it's not practical to have the other kinds of studies. The second part of the, the the study quality is the execution. Because again, you may have an RCT, but all RCTs are not the same. There are good, great RCTs, there are not so great RCTs. So we also look at the quality of the execution, both the internal validity, all the epidemiological concepts that you know we have to acknowledge, but also the external validity, how much are they contributing to the generalizability or the applicability of the findings. So all of those go into that decision making and then there is a translation table and a deliberative process. So for us, or at least in the public health world, we believe that that is really the gold standard, how it, how it is that you approach what you have. Okay, I wanna add to that, and I wanna share a little story. When I finished my postdoc at Harvard, I was fortunate enough to come to Georgetown, and the first thing I started doing was working on a National Cancer Institute career award. And so just like a good postdoc that I was trained, Dr. Rudd at Harvard, I contact my program officer and I said, I wanna do uh, this uh, community-based randomized control health communication intervention in um, DC communities. And he said to me, he said, what, how are you gonna evaluate this? You, you only have $30,000 in resources. And so one of the things I recognize when we're talking about community level health literacy interventions, and Andrew mentioned this in the earlier panel, I was fortunate enough to hear some of the comments. It really starts at the beginning, how you're going to, going to evaluate peace. You know, many times uh, the grantsmanship, uh, the funding all sort of constrain us when we're talking about evaluation. But I really wanted to do more, not just implement this study, but learn what did the communities really think. 
So in the District of Columbia, we know that D.C. is split up into wards. And I, as I started looking at the eight wards, I said, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could do some type of neighborhood level health literacy evaluation? But to do that would really take a lot of funding. And so what we have to do is maybe look at one a neighborhood or one community and that's sort of what I have found to be successful but how do I determine which community I want to look at and one of the things I immediately started doing was to start making connections in these uh, communities and I think uh, Everett Rogers he said it best you really have to look for that champion in that community to help you gain entree into these communities. And so I had an idea of what I thought I wanted to do, but then when I got into some of these communities, particularly I work in the southeast communities where, uh, and I'm just gonna talk about cancer. Well, if the cancer registry, I use that as my baseline data. If I see that in the southeast community, Ward 8, they have high cancer rates, breast, cervical, prostate. But then when I got into these communities, I start hearing other priorities, so I had to make those adjustments. So I think we don't really have good, robust, community-level health literacy exemplars. So I would say today that's where I see the deficit. We have a lot of good program um, evaluation examples. One of my favorite is um, the text for baby uh, uh, evaluation. Also, as I told Dr. Herman, I love the Head Start you know, uh, study and the program evaluations, but the evaluation has to be multi-level. Uh, mixed uh, pro approaches, I do a lot of qualitative, a lot of quantitative, um, and I am even want to applaud uh, national funders like the NIH because they're really putting a big emphasis on mixed methods research. We didn't always see uh, how even journals even would embrace qualitative research, but now we're starting to really see qualitative studies in scientific journals that we would only see studies published by bench scientists. So I think we're starting to see this evolve, and I think that's where we need to go, multi-level approaches at the community level, even at the neighborhood level. I think we can get to that. Thanks, Sherry. I'm, I'm going to push you guys a little further because you know, one of the things Cynthia said when she was talking about her paper this morning um, uh, after looking at the literature, where she said, scientific rigor can and should improve. Mm -hmm. So my question to you guys is, um, can you tell us about some of the methods, some of the data sources, some of the tools that we can use um, creatively to evaluate community health literacy interventions. And Sherry, you just mentioned a cancer r registry. So, you know, that's one source of data mm -hmm. that you might look at. Yeah. Um, Oscar, do you want to take a crack at that one? Sure. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, as I was hearing Andrew, I think he, he touched on a lot of, of key aspects of, of good evaluation, and you mentioned uh, execution and I think it's that's at the heart of you know is it going to be usable um, you have to definitely engage the community um, you can't be the tall white guy coming in with your perfect design <laughs> uh, and and expect it to to just run sm very smoothly that's what I've learned from doing research in in various communities throughout the country um, you you have an, uh, a, a an idea of a design, you you go into a community, I, I've learned you don't try to study it and learn it because there's just, there are two, way too many variables, but you try to recruit from within the community people that are doing evaluation work or, or, or the kind of research uh, and you make them part of your team. That's a key strategy. Uh, it, it just, uh, it, it it increases the validity of your findings tremendously. Uh, but in, in terms of tools, um, it, it really comes down to um, good data collection. You have the intervention. Um, 
and and then you want to get at was there knowledge gained uh, uh, and it all comes down to action. Did it lead to any kind of a different action which eventually leads to your change in your health outcome? And in order to, to, to get at that quality data, once again, a recurring theme is engaging uh, community members because we, I, I've, I've been uh, armed with, uh, with wonderful tools gone into a community and when we do the pilot, everybody just pretty much throws it up in the air. There's no way that uh, my service population is gonna answer your, your three or five page instrument. Uh, so it's really having that mindset um, uh, when you go into a community to do research, to collect data, you're, you're getting, extracting something valuable from community members. Uh, and then getting more specific to your question, um, uh, looking at, at validated instruments, uh, looking at models like the Kirkpatrick uh, uh, model for evaluating training programs where, uh, as Andrew said, you don't, you don't just look at satisfaction, were you satisfied with the way the information was delivered to you, but uh, what did you learn and what do you plan on doing it, with it? Again, getting at, at action. And, uh, and I think embedding in, uh, data collection instruments with those types of questions get you, gets you quality data that is, in the end, usable. Um, so. and, and Oscar, uh, because uh, many of our audience are not evaluators, could you, could you just very high level explain the Kirkpatrick model? Sure, I, I, um, it, it looks at four different levels. Uh, the, the first one is what was the information, the training information, um, uh, delivered in, 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 in an effective way to, to the participants. Uh, the second level, if I recall, is um, uh, did they understand the information? Can they connect what they learned to an action? Uh, and then the final, there, there, there's a, right, it, it's the actual behavior and, and measuring that. And so it's Kirkpatrick, uh, 1994, I think, is the Thank publication you. for that. And then, do you want to sure. um, So again, from the, I think, just theoretically, we could think about. So, so I live in the world of doing these systematic reviews, but uh, we look at the outcomes, we look at study design, all of the 14 things of systematic reviews, but we also look at the applicability for every review. We'll think about. So we bring together subject matter experts. We try to reach out as much into the community as possible, but it's always not. Uh, going to happen to the level that would be great, right? Uh, so we look at the context, trying to get at the context, the setting, the populations, uh, what is happening with equity, uh, what is happening with um, socioeconomic status, like are, do we have results for that? Obviously, as you can imagine, we do not have all of that information in large numbers for all of those questions, but that is the framework that with which we move forward because even when the task force comes up with a recommendation on the effectiveness of something or the cost effectiveness, people want to know, will it work for my constituents? So this applicability is a, is a step in the direction trying to get it. So this, this, this should work in most primary care settings or we do not find inf um, enough evidence that this can actually reduce health disparities. So even making those statements. So, it, so theoretically, you could look at the framework that say the systematic review people are looking for and then apply that in the community, but it's probably not practical and it's probably very expensive. But I think the essence of it, I think, uh, like Cynthia was saying, the rigor, right? That is so, the, the rigor that is applied to the systematic review, the rigor that's applied to the evaluation everywhere, if we, if you're sort of from A to Z, we, we map out everything that was done. From A to Z, the systematic review maps out everything that they look for then future people, other people can look at it and say whether it applies or not, whether this is something we can do differently. Uh, but always, when implementing, I would imagine that there is some unpacking to do. You can't just take one size and, and apply it there. This is unpacking and repacking. So the more context that we can see in the studies and the more context we can, we can synthesize in the systematic reviews, the better it is for future uh, implementation. I just want to say too, uh, one of the things we found most successful is before we even introduce 
products or uh, promotional materials. One great, great resource, uh, when I got to Georgetown, they had not established a community advisory board. So if you're at an academic institution or organization, that's just been a valuable tool. And one thing, understanding what community is. As academicians, we have our idea of what community is, but the community told us their idea of community did not parallel with what ours is. And what they said is that when you're putting together this board, we don't want people who don't live in our community only on the board or who are director this, vice president of this. We want people who live in our community on our board. So when you look at our board, you do see uh, stakeholders from D.C. Department of Health, but you also see people who actually live in these underserved communities. Uh, like Andrew said, a PhD is not required. Some of them don't have a degree. Some of them may not even have a job, but they know what works in their community. And one of the things we started doing with this community advisory board, we created um, a community listserv. And so when we needed uh, things pre-tested, we do cognitive interviews, so we're not developing tools and taking these tools into the community and then having the community tell us, okay, this is not gonna work. And one example, we were doing a, a study to increase um, mammography screening among blacks and Hispanics. And we came up with like a short one page pre and post test and we also did training modules. And the women came back and said, you know, this, this word, you know, what is this word? And the word was mammogram. And we just automatically assumed that these women would understand mammogram. So we had to go back to what plain language has said, use images, because uh, it's really difficult to explain the process of a mammogram, and you certainly don't want to put fear in people who say basically it's some smashing and pressing, so you don't want to use those <laughs> words. So we, we took this to the women in the community, and we sort of like explained it, and then when we sent the survey out, we had over 85 percent uh, response rate but had we just taken the survey that we developed and took that out into these underserved communities and so I, I can't emphasize enough just making sure that you have community advisory boards and working with them when you don't have a grant due you know because communities have said don't just call us when you got a grant due in 30 days and you need a letter of support Okay, so working with them for the long haul and being invested in the community for the long haul and not just when you need something done is important. Yes, well, that is a great segue into uh, my next question because as Oscar said, a reoccurring theme that we've been hearing today is around community engagement. And so I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about how, you know, the appropriate role and how you go about engaging communities and given that this is a roundtable on health literacy, does this differ at all for health literacy work as opposed to other community-based research? So, Oscar, you want to try? Sure. But just to piggyback on, on your last comment, Sherry, um, I've been told um, by, by community members, don't treat me like a stepchild. <laughs> and it's basically getting at that, at that uh, very uh, specific instance where you, you do have an opportunity for funding, you come to them uh, to sign them up. You know, uh, it, it's a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and to, for, for true community engagement to, to occur, um, it's all about, as you said, execution, even coming up with a community advisory board. Who are you inviting uh, to, to chair that advisory group? Um, yeah, and what is a community? It's not just a zip code. It's, it's, it's a lot about uh, relationships that individuals have with each other. That's what really creates a community. Uh, so it's really operationalizing all of those uh, small uh, uh, decisions that we make as we enter a community to, to conduct an evaluation. Um, and, and it really, the, the how is 
I think I mentioned earlier, strategy is to uh, identify the location uh, and understand which CBOs operate there and what universities have are currently doing research there, uh, and then recruiting for your evaluation team from within. And that does a couple of things um, that, uh, m you know, your learning curve just, you know, it, it improves significantly because you, you're not having to really study up on the community. You, you already have all that local knowledge. Um, but also, uh, it, it really starts, you start to establish uh, a, a trust with the community, which in my research is, is very significant. Uh, for the for the knowledge gain for the measures that we're all interested in uh, intent to, to act on information that is being delivered to them if they trust you they are more likely to do what what uh, what you're training them to do uh, or what you're training them to, to help understand so um, my, my point uh, is uh, engaging them throughout the spectrum of the study from conceptualizing your design uh, uh, evaluation questions, developing all data collection instruments, um, usability, what Andrew was saying. Uh, how is it going to be useful to your community to improve? Um, and then I want to go back. A third point uh, to that strategy is putting money into the community as well. So incentives, you're hiring somebody from the community. Uh, putting dollars back into it really gives you a lot of credibility. Uh, so looking for those opportunities. Uh, a quick example, do I have time? Yeah. Uh, uh, recently I, I've been working uh, with, uh, with a healthcare system um, and they do these, uh, these community um, uh, uh, health uh, events. And so th they, they set up the parking lot of, of the hospital and community members come and they get information. Um, the, the slight tweak uh, to that was, why don't you partner with either a church or a community health center, uh, uh, a, an entity within the community, and provide them with a stipend, some, some funds to cover the cost of using that space. And that made all the difference. So it's those little decisions that you make throughout the evaluation that make a huge uh, uh, impact at the end and make the data usable. And it's all, again, going back to execution. And, <laughs> so. and let me see if I could just highlight something that I, th that I heard, which was getting back to Andrew's point about meaningfulness. So the impor important role for the community is actually choosing, helping choose measures that are going to be meaningful to them. Is that? And uh, Sherry, did you want to get in on this one? Okay. Um, I would say uh, how we engage the community is first identifying that liaison or champion in the community. This is usually someone that's well respected. And so I'll give you a, an example. In Southeast DC, um, there's a woman that lives in Southeast and she helps run a community garden and her name is Miss Betty. And everybody knows Miss Betty. And you're not gonna get anything done if it doesn't go through Miss Betty. She helps the police out. She is just the eyes and ears of that community. So identifying people in the community that can help you gain entree into the community so that people feel like this is somebody I can trust. And we have to uh, be honest here. You know, communities have a good reason why they don't want to trust researchers or even participate in, in research. And so first, to engage them, you have to gain entry into the community. So Andrew talk, uh, talked about you can't be the white guy with the pen and paper, where you might not can even be a black female with a pencil of paper. You can't just walk up in the, into these communities. And across the U.S., many communities are setting up boards that will vet 
research that's being done in their community. And I dare say, if you don't go through these boards to gain approval, your study is gonna be very successful. So here in the district in Ward 8, there's the Ward 8 Health Council. And if you really wanna get a study or evaluation study going, you go and you present before this board. And these are lay people, all lay people, that will will assess will this help our community does this study meet the priorities of of our community so those are some ways and then understanding and trying to help the community understand that you're not there just to do research about the community but you're there to do research with the community and that's a big distinction and i think as long as you can communicate that build that trust and one of the things I found successful, I started getting involved in the community long before I wanted to start in the research. So little things like visiting um, the, um, the stores, the small businesses in the community so they could get to know me. When we had meetings, I would try to find like a local caterer in that community that I could do business with, as you said, put money back into the community. And I'm proud to say we have hired two persons from um, the community uh, in D.C. by the Na Nationals Baseball Stadium. A lot of people are unaware. There are five public housing communities right behind the nation, uh, the Nationals Baseball Stadium, and we have hired people. They're now Georgetown employees. So I think when you can see that kind of investment, and this is not something every institution can do, but you know, our president, he really bought into you know this notion of not just doing. Uh, research about the community but doing research in the community we now have a Georgetown Lombardi community based office that's a research office that's located in Southeast DC you know a, a underserved a medically underserved area so when the community can see that you're actually investing and you're not doing what's referred to as helicopter research, where researchers just come in, collect all this data, then run and write your papers uh, and get more funding. I think that that's what helps you engage the community. Thank you. It's a little bit of the opposite of being a helicopter parent, which just stays and hovers. You sort of got the exit strategy. Um, so this is gonna be a hard question, but um, you know, w as I mentioned, this is a workshop about health literacy. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how in our, in our evaluations of community health literacy interventions, do we make sure that individuals with limited health literacy benefit, um, as opposed to just looking at the entire community level? Um, Anil, you want to yeah, start I mean, that? Okay. I can talk about it from uh, how we look at, say, health equity in community guide reviews. Uh, so you have interventions, uh, just the way we approach it, we have interventions that uh, are within a health equity topic. So we have a, just like we have multiple topics at the, at the community guide, cardiovascular disease prevention, tobacco, alcohol policy, motor vehicles. So health equity is one topic. Um, so within health equity, we started with early education interventions because, again, you have the uh, link between early education programs and uh, better outcomes later on in life and health. And so focusing on um, certain early education programs that uh, mainly serve uh, historically underserved populations uh, are is a one way to look at health equity. But having, having that, and then when you look at any other review, even if you're doing a CBD prevention review, um, like I was saying before, when we're abstracting data from those studies, we're looking at the applicability, we're looking at what are the populations within that setting. So uh, w was it an underserved population? Was it a low income? Um, this thing, or are there stratified results by, by the different participants? Um, so we always make the effort to get that information and, and synthesize that. So it really, um, we really can't go beyond that uh, in many ways. So if we have that information, if people include that, again, the context, uh, when they're 
writing out their evaluations because again, we we'll just live in that world where we get the peer review publications. We, we're still not there yet where we can go to the community and evaluate as it's happening for the, for the evidence aspect of it. So, but the, we're always looking for that information, always looking to see if we have results ratified by, you know, uh, groups that may have, uh, might be disadvantaged, and then what it is that we can do with that in this industry. So uh, I hear you talking about some of the other social determinants of health, but I'm, I'm really, you know, yeah. plugging for the limited health literacy. You, you don't have to, I mean, we can move on, I'm just. I mean, just to, yeah. to up, yeah, we haven't, and I think from this experience, that's something that we can add to our methods and we can think more about. And that goes into our standard abstraction structure. I definitely think we've gone, we've covered health literacy in different ways, but not explicitly. And I think this group can help us think more about how we collect that data. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely, the concept would be the same. We want to know as much as we can from the studies so that we can bring it back to implementers and decision makers. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, you, you know, it has to be intentional, not haphazard. And so from the very beginning, you have to look at, you know, what's your baseline? Oftentimes I'm looking at national reports like IOM, Healthy People 2020. So, you know, you're trying to establish a baseline, which would then help you to establish a target for that individual or, or the po population. And I work a lot also with federally qualified health centers. They have a different set of metrics. So first you gotta determine, you know, what's your metrics, what's your baseline, and then, you know, what's your targets. And you get that from national reports. I, I personally like the Healthy People 2020, which can be a great benchmark. So you set your be benchmarks. And at the individual level, you might look at improved knowledge, you might also look at adherence. I do HPV vaccination, so we're constantly looking at HPV uptake and then also completion, and then whether or not uh, the parents are bringing uh, the teens back in for the first and second dose. It used to be three doses, now the policy has changed to two. So establish, establishing a criteria or those metrics for how you're going to assess at the individual level and then also at the uh, population level and then also uh, with working with uh, federally qualified health centers at, at the quality improvement level because as federally qualified health centers they have a, a different set of metrics so sitting down and determining you know what's the criteria what's the metrics and then setting your baseline and then looking uh, at, at your target and then always then simply asking, you know, uh, the individual or communities, you know, using your formative data, you know, we like to use quality, uh, like I said, cognitive interviews, even motivational interviewing is a good resource. And you have to go back and ask them, you know, how, how are you doing with this? You know, what's the, how do you feel this is helping you? And then combining that, what data that you have from your data sets and you have uh, pulling data from multiple approaches. And I think that that's the, one of the best ways we've been successful. Thanks. Um, uh, some members of our audience um, come from, you know, under-resourced organizations that are trying to do health literacy work. And their question for us was, you know, how, how can they approach evaluation um, and try and evaluate with, you know, very limited amounts of resources? How can they connect with qualified evaluators? You know, they're, they're out there kind of doing the work and they do want to produce the evidence. Um, Oscar, do you want to? Yeah, sure. sure. I, I think I touched upon this earlier. Uh, you know, I've been in that situation. Um, how do you stretch that dollar as much as possible? Uh, and, and there are a number of strategies, and, and the one that I've repeated is, is going into the community, uh, analyzing which uh, community-based organizations are currently doing work with your, your target population. Uh, they are the most knowledgeable. Um, 
once you identify those CBOs, you can then start seeing within those organizations, do they have evaluation capacity? Um, also, once you identify your, your locality, uh, what universities are currently doing work there? Um, I've, I've partnered with a lot of universities. There are a lot of uh, volunteers that can be uh, uh, coerced <laughs> into, uh, into working on an evaluation project. Um, uh, in terms of getting qualified, tested, experienced evaluators, uh, my go-to resource is eval.org. The, the American Evaluation Association does have a database of experienced evaluators, and some of them uh, have, uh, on occasion, worked for free, pro bono. Uh, so that, that is a, a great resource. But I think the, the other strategy is really um, breaking down, doing a, a work breakdown on the evaluation and identifying pieces that can go uh, to different folks uh, so that you can identify, uh, you know, what is that minimal budget that you have to work with and what are those tasks that they can uh, help help you complete because um, it's, it's not going to be one of these, uh, find one evaluator and then just let them run with it. Uh, you definitely have to have control of that evaluation process. Does, Great tips, does, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would say again, just to reiterate what Andrew said, e always think that evaluation starts at the beginning when you're doing your planning. So when you're doing your planning, and I know this so well, uh, uh, one of my mentors at Georgetown said, just because you put it in your budget doesn't mean it's going to get funded, but you always put it in your budget. Because if you don't put it in the budget, you, you never have a chance of it getting funded. So you always put that in there and think about evaluation at the beginning. And then, as Anil said, there are a lot of academic institutions. Like I'm in a med school, but we have a school of nursing. And don't forget about your uh, psychology departments. Um, they do great work. Uh, Every uh, academic institution that has a graduate program, the graduate students, the doctoral students, many times they have to have projects that they need to work on. And many times if they're uh, on fellowship or have money, they can't get any additional funding. I always love and seek out those types of students. And then also, this is just a really neat program, the Annie E. Casey Foundation. They've started a national evaluation uh, training program for primarily junior faculty at institutions training the, uh, these junior faculty how to become evaluators. And these, all of these fellows going through these programs, they have to have a project. And so that will be a great resource if you do not have a lot of funding, contact to Annie E. Casey to see if your organization could be one of those project sites. Um, you know, another thing that when we said we were going to have a panel on evaluation that the audience members asked us to address was, how do I find out what works? You know, I I'm, I, I want to know, you know, what what are our uh, what have the evaluations produced, and and how can I seize that? Neil, I see you. Sorry, I'm gonna plug yes. my uh, employer. Uh, so come to the community guide, uh, thecommunityguide.org. Uh, there's over 250 now, I believe, recommendations across the uh, span of the health spectrum, from health equity to tobacco to cardiovascular disease prevention, always growing. And the more you come to our website and the more feedback you give us, we can also understand whether it's useful to, to implementers and users and researchers, evaluators or not, and what is it that we can improve. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're looking to put on our website, including our methods, our latest methods, our processes, uh, we also have a dissemination implementation team that works with groups, uh, technical um, uh, 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 consultations on implementation, and we try to work with our partners. Uh, so there's no specific condition that the community guide works at. It works at all of the uh, uh, areas, and we also look at the healthcare system, but also services and policies, which 
are always challenging to evaluate because you again you don't get the RCTs. Uh, so and the final thing is the task force also identifies evidence gaps uh, for any, each of the reviews. They look at evidence gaps. So because of the framework with which they go ahead, they say these are the things that we could not find in the evidence, and that sort of hopes they hope that that spurs future research, future evaluations that can plug those gaps. Great, and I guess now we have a new resource um, that Cynthia's paper will be posted on the National Academy's website and has uh, a whole bunch of, of study references there. Yeah, sorry, Sherry, you, you want to get in there, okay. Um, and even though I'm in cancer, I just wanted to uh, also mention the National Cancer Institute has um, the uh, uh, cancer, uh, not planet, I think, I can't remember. Yes. Yeah, Cancer yes. Planet, yeah, that's it, it just escaped me. And that's a great resource, it's, it's set up by a disease like prostate cancer, cervical, and all of their uh, funded studies that have been vetted uh, on there, it's a great resource tool. You can see uh, the study uh, protocol as well as the promotional and evaluation tools examples of pre and post test surveys, randomized controlled trials. So that's a great resource for you to, to look at to see what has worked. That's great. Um, so I'm going to ask the panel one more question before we open it up to questions for people in the room. So if people want to start moving to the mics now, that would be great. And if you don't, I have some other questions that I'll go ahead and ask. So not to threaten anyone. Um, so one of the, uh, uh, was very interesting to me to see this question arise um, from our audience members, which was what happens if you evaluate and you find it doesn't work, it's not successful, what then? So um, why don't we, maybe yeah. each of you could yeah. comment on that. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is a, um, a debate that I've had with my, my federal clients over the years where uh, some of them think, well, you're evaluating and 90% uh, of evaluations are positive, uh, <laughs> published. But uh, what, you know, what do you do with, with failure? And I think failure is very important and uh, you, you can learn a lot. Uh, I, I've certainly learned uh, how to do better at engaging uh, with communities. Um, uh, but uh, an evaluation can really give you valuable information on how to fine tune an intervention uh, from, you know, your materials that maybe were not very well understood to the way that they were presented, your engagement strategy, uh, how you how you um, how you looked for for uh, participants. Um, it, it could just be a wealth of information uh, that could help you uh, modify, improve the, the intervention so that next time it is, it is more uh, impactful. Yeah, I just reiterate that. I think what's, what is worse than not doing something that works is doing something that doesn't work, right? Um, and we are uh, afflicted by publication bias. That's just the world we live in. Um, almost all the studies that we get, we, I can't remember, I've done, I think, 10 systematic reviews with hundreds of studies. I can't remember a study that said, don't do this. We, we did yes. everything <laughs> and it was a spectacular failure. Don't ever do this or <laughs> think carefully before you do it. It was always like, we had the one outcome that was great, but all these other seven maybe because of this. And so they're almost being defensive. <laughs> And if you've done a great evaluation, you know, back yourself, like we watch all these live videos that say, don't be scared of failure. You know, that's only gonna make you better. So it's the same thing applies. And especially for somebody like me or for my, my group, having that information really helps a lot because we can bring it to that common area where everybody can look at it and say, this is the evidence, this is something that doesn't work or it didn't work in the way that it was done there. And what can, can we make it better or should we abandon it? or leave it for another day. So we can have that discussion, which is what we need to do. So it would be great if, you know, we're not shy of, of, of quote unquote failure. And I was gonna say, we need, uh, if there, there are editors out there of journals, we need journals that will welcome and embrace publication 
of these types of studies so other people can read in these peer-reviewed journals what worked and what didn't work and lessons learned. And I would just say it's so important that when it doesn't work, you go back to the community and go from A to Z and say, here's what we did well, here's what didn't work so well, and get feedback as to why they think that this particular thing didn't work. And I think that's so important to always take it back to the community that you're trying to target. Well, you're in luck, Sherry, because we do have some journal editors in the room um, from the new health literacy um, uh, research and practice. So um, 